Hello and welcome to another episode of La Revue. I'm your host, Mars Amit, joined by Craig Rich and Kieran Sobels. We're talking about quite a few things today, from Ronaldo's unhappiness to Falcao's astronomic goal scoring, and also Zenit St. Petersburg's bending. But before we get on with that, Kieran's going to do the EPL wrap-up of the weekend for us. Hello, Kieran. Over to you. Yep, day Mars. Good week in the EPL, I thought. Started off midweek with Chelsea beating Reading 4-2. Good game from Hazard again there. Wins for West Ham, West Brom and Manchester City. Uh, Tottenham continued their poor start with a draw against uh, Norwich at home. So, uh, Villas Boas clearly has a bit of work to do with Spurs there. Uh, they haven't started too convincingly. Uh, Swansea drew with Sunderland. Uh, Newcastle did as well with Villa. Uh, Manchester United Southampton was an interesting one this weekend. Um, two late Van Persie goals got uh, the win for them, at, despite Southampton actually dominating quite a lot of that game. Uh, and Van Persie will be very happy to get his first hat trick with his new team. But uh, I thought Southampton were pretty unlucky there. They they still are without a point, but that doesn't really do them credit. They've they've performed actually quite reasonably in the EPL so far. Uh, the game of the weekend, though, I thought was Arsenal and Liverpool. Arsenal defeated Liverpool at home. Uh, Podolski and Casola both getting on the score sheet for the first time this season, which uh, will do their confidence the world of good. I thought Casola again, uh, Arsenal's best play. He's just been a, a great buy for them, really. A lot of a bit of criticism for Brendan Rodgers uh, due to Liverpool's uh, low standing on the table at the moment, but um, I think he's actually done a reasonable job playing some good football, but at the end of the day, their forward line, they just don't have the right players there at the moment. Yeah, so, uh, but an, an interesting week all in all in, in the EPL. Um, what have you got for us uh, from Germany, Mars? Well, the key game from Germany, really, was Bayern Munich against uh, WFB Stuttgart, where Stuttgart got the lead first, and Munich fired six goals, two of which came within a minute. And that really was the game to watch from Germany. Apart from that, uh, a bit of disappointing news as uh, Borussia Dortmund drew 1-1 with Nuremberg. Leverkusen won against Freiburg and their new signing, Danny Carvajal from Real Madrid, made the team of the week for Bundesliga. So that's a bit of good news for both Real Madrid and Leverkusen fans. Schalke defeated Augsburg 3-1 and Werder Bremen won 2-0 against Hamburg. So those were just the key games from the, the Bundesliga. I'll go over to Craig for La Liga now. Interesting uh, round of fixtures. We saw Celta Vigo beat Osasuna 2-0. Uh, Malaga beat Zaragoza 1-0, continuing to win despite their internal troubles. Uh, Deportivo La Coruña drew with Getafe. Uh, Malaga beating Real Sociedad. Uh, we saw Sevilla's disappointing uh, run of the season continue with a draw to Ray Vallecano. Uh, and Levante beat Espanyol in a thrilling game, uh, winning 3-2 there. Uh, we saw my three games... Uh, to watch this round, we saw Athletic Bilbao beat Valladolid. Thought they were very, very good. Uh, player there, Suzaretta was amazing. He did everything. Blocked a shot off the, the goal line, hit the post and even scored a goal and got six shots off as well. So he was brilliant playing on the, uh, right wing there. We saw Real Madrid finally get a win in La Liga, beating Granada 3-0. Um, the man of the headlines, Ronaldo getting two goals. And Alonso uh, managing up 100 passes, which is pretty phenomenal for any team that isn't Barcelona. Uh, we saw Barcelona get an early goal and end up winning. I think the man of the match there was Messi, but Adriano performed very well as, as well. Uh, talking about Barcelona uh, at the moment, they have been winning both at half-time and full-time in 20 of the last 28 matches. So they continue to be the unbeaten team in La Liga at the moment. Now to uh, Serie A fixtures with Mars. Thank you, Craig. And that was enviable statistics from Barcelona again. I'm getting used to it now. Okay, in Serie A, well, it, it looks all set for Juventus once again because they continue their strong stride. They defeated Udinese well, 1-4. It was an away game. They got three points, scored four goals. Apart from that, the big game, I think, on Sunday night was Internazionale versus AS Roma. Where Internazionale continued to go downhill. New signing, Kisano uh, got a goal and equalised, but they never really looked like they're going to win this one. And Roma ran away with the three points, scored the three goals. Uh, there was an injury to De Rossi. Uh, a bit of concern for Roma there. Apart from that, in another game, it was Napoli versus Fiorentina. Craig's beloved Fiorentina, and they lost 2-1 against Napoli. 
Apart from that, AC Milan finally got a win, which is good news for Milan fans because new signing Pazzini got a hat trick in that. It impressed Adriano Galliani of all people, who's comparing Pazzini to to Inzaghi now. He thinks they've got a new Inzaghi uh, with Pazzini. He scored a hat trick, got Milan the three points they deserved. Uh, the rest of the games were not really big scoring games. Sampdoria won two one against Siena. Parma defeated Cavarone two nil. Lazio won three nil against uh, Palermo. And Catania beat Genoa 3-2. Uh, Cagliari and Atlanta drew one apiece. That's just about it from this area. Now guys, uh, Van Persie and Pazzini aren't the only strikers to get a hat-trick recently. We all saw what uh, Falcao did to Chelsea in the UEFA Super Cup. Did you guys catch that game? Yeah, I did. I thought, I thought it was a great game. And I love to see Chelsea get beaten like that. <laughs> That's a delightful yeah. Yeah, I thought it was it was brilliant performance by Falcao in the, in the first half. And, uh, yeah, Chelsea really didn't show up on that day. It's like they uh, didn't really do their research on Atletico Madrid or anything at all. They just rocked up expecting to win a trophy and they got severely uh, handed to them, I think. Right, yeah. so bearing that in mind, would you guys would you guys say that Falcao is currently, on current form, the best striker in the world? Greg? <laughs> Do you want to go first? Or do you want to go first? Um, I I would I think maybe there are uh, better forwards out there. Obviously, there's um, look. Let's leave Messi and Ronaldo out for a second, but I do think there are probably better all-round forwards out there. You go to players like Ibrahimovic, Aguero, maybe. But as a pure number nine, I've been thinking about it. I think I think he is actually probably the best um, around right now. I just yeah, he's so good in the box. Uh, um, that first uh, chip goal was just oh, amazing, brilliant finish. Craig, what do you think? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dispute with you there for a second. I think Lionel Messi is the best number nine in the world. Whether he plays as a false nine or anything, he has been Barcelona's centre forward, striker, slash whatever you want to call it, for the past couple of seasons, and he is the undisputed best in the world. You give him the ball inside the box or outside the box, he's most likely to score. It's different to Ronaldo. He, Ronaldo's a forward as well, but he usually plays as a left forward and it's a different sort of tactics and everything altogether. For me, Lionel Messi, best centre forward, best number nine in the world, without a doubt. If we take that away, we look at other players apart from Messi. Falcao is an extremely good player and one of the best, but you have to remember we've got players like Robin Van Persie, who was undoubtedly one of the best uh, last season, scores as many goals, if not more. And you've got other players who do a lot more, um, not only in, in the Europa League, but at smaller clubs, I feel, with um, less personnel around them. Players like Klaas Jan Huntelaar, for instance, who scored more goals in, in the Europa League. He scored 14 goals in 12, and he scored 29 goals in the league, which was more than Falcao's uh, 24 last season. Falcao's a great player, don't get me wrong. He's done it in Porto and he's done it at Atletico Madrid, but I do believe there are better number nines out there. I think people are getting carried away a little bit. I've said recently that Chelsea's defence is very suspect. They got shown up time and time again in uh, the EPL. Despite winning games, they have been winning games, don't get me wrong, but their defences looked extremely poor while winning those games. Uh, we saw Falcao destroy Bilbao, and that was a very good performance again, but I think uh, I could have dug up my grandma and she could have scored three goals against that team. <laughs> Seriously. Um, I, would, I do think, um, just one thing you said, that I think it's credit to him that he's came from Porto, uh, scored so many goals over there, and straight away he's adapted to Spain. It's not easy, and he's come straight away, and he's, he's he was the third top scorer after Messi and Ronaldo, and he scored 36 last year, and I thought... Sorry to cut you off there, Kieran. I was going to talk about last season as well. If you look at uh, the top scorer's uh, table from La Liga last season, you see Lionel Messi at top with 50 goals, Ronaldo not very far, number two with 46 goals, and, and then Falcao, number three with 24 goals. You see the gap there between Cristiano Ronaldo and Lionel Messi and then other players. Do you think it's down to the service they receive at Barcelona and Real Madrid or they're well, just out of this world? Talking about Falcao coming over and doing well, like Kieran said, that's fair enough. He did very, very well. But you've got to remember, he was the only player receiving the ball most of the time in the final third. He was the focal point of attack. And for the first six months, he wasn't that good. He was patchy at best, very inconsistent, and a lot of people were questioning spending that much money on him. He came very, very good in the second half of the season, I'll grant you that, but it did take him a long time to really get into the stride of things. And he still is a little inconsistent, very patchy at times in scoring his goals. 
Um, is he the best number nine in the world? Well, as I said, I'll hand that to Messi. I'll give that to him. But I do, I do think there are better other options out there. He's a very young player, though, and I see a huge future for him if he can make a step up into a, a one of the biggest clubs in the world. Right, so that's uh, Craig's verdict on Falcao, and I think I'll agree with it. Moving on from there, uh, we're going to talk about Ronaldo and his unhappiness. He really gave a bad flavour at the end to a game that he decorated so well with two goals and first three points of this league campaign for Real Madrid. Craig, there have been numerous rumours circulating on the internet. I, for one, especially play down the one linked with a better contract, because I don't think Ronaldo would negotiate for a better contract in this fashion. But apart from that, the ones that I think I might agree with could be uh, Fabio Contrao. Some people believe in that, because Contrao and whatever happened between Contrao and the referee and Remedy didn't really come out to support him, and Ronaldo is the sort of player who would talk in favour of his teammates. That, that could be one, because we all know it's got to be a professional reason and not personal. The other is that Ronaldo asked for a minute of silence to be held for his, for his father's death anniversary, and the club denied that. What theory would you go with, Craig? Well, I'm unsure. Me and Karen were discussing this before, and we were very perplexed by it. I was mentioning some things uh, to Kieran. I'll, I'll say them right now. Uh, Kaka came out and released a statement saying, um, to Cristiano, I would just like to tell him that he has the support of the entire team. We need him, and he has to be happy. He has all our support. Um, Abelo on Twitter did a very similar thing, posting a picture of him and Cristiano arm in arm, saying, you know, he has the entire team support. We love you, etc., etc." Um, the Don Alfredo Di Stefano came out and Marco said the exact same thing that he supports Cristiano Ronaldo in what's going on at the moment so if this was a really professional thing like contracts or whatever else uh, I, I don't think all these players would be in the team and everything would be coming up and supporting him in this it, it doesn't make sense to me that he'd ask for a minute, minute of silence for his father's death because really his father has nothing to do with Real Madrid or the world of you know, the football or it just makes no sense why he would ask for that what I personally believe, I have no idea. As I said to Kieran, it makes no sense to me. It obviously, obviously was a deliberate thing to come out and say he was sad for whatever reason. I'm not sure, but I can't believe it's it's just very confusing. What do you think, Kieran? Yeah, I think you've got it right there. With I think the weirdest thing about it is he's come out, he's, he's said that he's sad, but then straight away he said, I don't want to say any more. Uh, if he didn't want to say anything at all, he wouldn't have said it. You know, he wouldn't have brought it up. So obviously he wants it to be... Uh, brought into the spotlight on some sort of level, um, you know, speculating on what actually it is. I've absolutely no idea. It's it's really confusing right now. I guess we'll probably find out in the next few days, I guess. So let's move on to the last talking point for uh, this episode, which is Zenit and Petersburg making big moves. They've got Hulk, they've got Alex Witzel, and you never know what might happen from there. What do you have on Zen for us, Craig? Yeah, um, this is even more confusing than the Ronaldo statement. Um, we saw uh, Anzi try and get into the transfer market last season, spending lots of money, you know, buying up big names like Ito, and it really didn't work out too well for them. They didn't even win the league. Uh, we've seen PSG do it recently as well, and that hasn't served them too well. But then at St. Petersburg, I thought they're going to give it a go and see how well they do. I mean, they've already got such players as, you know, Bruno Alves. They've got a very good team with players like Denisov and Malaviv already and Semak. But they've decided to add to that with the signings of Axel uh, Witzel and the Hulk. I mean, they've spent £83 million in two days for two players. And uh, it's going to be very interesting to see what they can do uh, in the Champions League, especially when they face the likes of Milan and Malaga. What do you think, Kieran? That is going to be an interesting group, isn't it? Because we've been talking already about uh, Milan's problems and uh, also Malaga's problems. Uh, they did do a few things on deadline day last week. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is just came out of the blue for me. When when Porto was saying, uh, you got to pay up $80 million, that's his release clause, you didn't think anyone was going to do it. But you, that's the sort of statement that you, you think a club's going to have so that teams will, will up their bids. But I never thought someone would actually come out and pay 80 million euros for Hulk. And then, uh, obviously, Witzel, a further 40 million. It's, it's just uh, incredible, really. But, yeah, as you say, they've got a good 
team there. They've got uh, a solid first 11, so they're going to be a real force there, and they were the champions last year in Russia, so uh, they'll probably be able to re- retain their crown with that, that squad, you'd think. Do you, do you, I was going to ask you, Karen, do you think they could top the group and actually go further in the Champions League with this team, or do you think it's going to take them a bit of time to actually gel and find their feet? Well, yeah, you'd, it's, I guess it's down partly to if these players hit the ground running. But, you know, Milan and Malaga both will be having similar issues. So this group really is, uh, you know, you, I don't think you can really predict it. Uh, one, one of these teams could really just crash out. But, uh, yeah, no idea, really. It, it's, just, it's interesting. So I was going to ask you the same question, Mars. But for me, I see this Champions League as not as strong as previous years. I mean, we've still got Real Madrid, Barcelona, etc. But I still think there's a, there's a chance for a few teams to make a foray, and maybe that's what Zenit St. Petersburg were thinking, with a couple of big buyers, a couple of big players, but they're already strong team that they can actually try and do some damage and actually get far in the Champions League. What do you think of that, uh, Mars? Yeah, I do see them progressing from their group at least, because like Kieran said, gelling together won't really be a problem for Zenit P- St. Petersburg, because they are in a group, Milan and Malaga, who sort of have the same problem. I agree with Kieran on that one. Now, with, with a team like Zenit, they are a usual name in the Champions League and this year sort of looks ideal for them because all across Europe you see the strong names aren't so strong this season. Talk about Remory in Barcelona or Chelsea. We've all seen how they've done in the league so far. So I really think this is the right time for a new team to step into that last 16 or last 8 segment of the Champions League that we have. And with Zenit buying all these big players and being the Russian champions, I I do see some opportunity for them. Good for football, do you reckon? This... This uh, investment. Well, I personally I, I, don't see anything wrong with it. What do you What do you think, Craig? I, I don't know. I mean, it might be good for football, a bit more competition, but I don't understand from the players' perspective why you'd want to go to Russia. I mean, I know it's good money, offering you a good contract, but for your career, for you know, your own personal career, is is it a wise move? I'm unsure. You know. Yeah, I'd agree. I mean, players like Hulk, he's he talked about wanting to join the Premier League for so long, and he was. Prime to join either, I thought, Premier League or La Liga, either one, he'd just rip it up. And he's made a completely sideways move, or almost. I mean, this team is going to be in the Champions League, but still, uh, in terms of money, I mean, you earn so much money anyway as a footballer. Personally, I mean, it's hard to say, but, you know, you'd think you'd want to be at a, at a team which is uh, has a bit of a history, renowned, you know, you want to further your career in some way. It, it does, it is a bit confusing in some ways, but I guess, uh, you know, it's good for Russian fans and I guess, you know, spreading football around a bit more. With uh, Witzlock, I can sort of understand him going, he's still a bit young, he can probably make a career himself, but I think Hulk's 26 now, um, you know, he probably spent a year or two in Russia. You think he's still got the chance to make it up move to a big club after that, or do you think that's it for him? He's really going to stay there. It's interesting. Maybe he's trying to just get some quick money in the pocket or something and see how they do go in the Champions League uh, for a couple of years. But, uh, um, you know, if they do have this sort of money, then it's going to be hard to uh, to get rid of him. For, for, sorry, for another team to buy him. Uh, they're going to try to hold on to him, I guess. So, uh, at 26, yeah, I mean... We'll see how he goes, really. Yeah, that at large depends on how this season goes for him. If it's a, if it's a major fail, he might have to compromise a lot of things, less a salary or something, to go and play football elsewhere. Yeah, then he'll have missed his chance, so it's a um, big yeah. move for him, I guess. I mean, there is no denying that money is the biggest incentive in this sort of deals, but don't you think it's also an exciting sort of a risk for a player? I mean, if you go out in a relatively smaller or lesser-known team, and you make a name for yourself there. I mean, of course, money is the incentive, but don't you think that's a, a bit of an adventure in the players' part too? Yeah, yeah. but it's hard because, as, as Kieran was saying, they've paid $40 million for Witzel and you know, God knows how much money for Hulk. Who's going to come in in a year or two and try and buy these players for as much or if not more from a league in Russia? What can, what can they really prove themselves Unless they do amazingly well in the Champions League and then do really well in the international stage, I, I can't see a team going out and spending that much money, especially with financial fair play coming in, etc. You're seeing a lot of clubs being very careful in the market. 
Um, unless like PSG or Man City come along, I don't, I don't see it. So that's all you'll hear from us for this week. Clap football will be interrupted by the international break for two weeks. But when we are back next week, we'll be back with a lot more stories, analysis and views. Thank you for listening and join us again next week. Thank you.